Hey guys, this is AC Service Tech, and today we're looking at are what are the normal operating pressures for R22 and R410A in comfort cooling systems. So we're talking about package units, we're talking about split systems, uh, we're talking about single speed mini splits, not necessarily inverter style ones. So we're going to go ahead and go over what the pressure parameters are. Okay, and I'm going to discuss um, the different things that affect those pressures for the high side and the low side. So before we get started, I just want to explain this gauge right here is going to tell you what's happening at the indoor coil in cooling mode. And this gauge right here is going to tell you what is happening at the outdoor condenser in cooling mode. All right, so this here always has to be above 32 degrees. So you have an out, a, uh, outside ring, which is pressure. And green indicates R22, saturated temperature. You have a saturated state at the evaporator coil, right in the middle of the evaporator coil. You have a saturated state right in the middle of the condenser coil. The saturated state is where liquid and vapor both exist at the same time. And that's happening right in the middle of both of those coils. So a pressure will line up with a temperature if it's R22 or if it is R410A, which is the pink ring right here. And that will tell you what the temperature is in the middle of the evaporator coil while it's running, even though your gauge set's hooked up at the outdoor unit. So let's just uh, look at this real quick. If we have, uh, let's just say, 55 PSIG, and we follow it over to the green, 30 degrees, then that means that our evaporator coil is freezing. So if you have let the system run for 5 to 10 minutes and you see that the actual temperature of the evap coil is 30 degrees, then that might be that you have a problem right there, okay? That could be a dirty filter or low blower speed. Um, the blower could be broken. You could have an obstruction in the duct. You know, you could be low on refrigerant. You could have a, a clog in the liquid line heading to the evaporator coil. A, a bunch of different things, okay? But basically, that means that you are not operating correctly because you're below freezing and that evap coil is going to go ahead and freeze solid. All right, likewise with R410A, if you have 100 PSIG, then 100 PSIG is right below 32 degrees, and R410A in the EVAP coil is going to end up freezing. That means you're low on refrigerant or some other issue with airflow or a restriction in the line. Now the outdoor coil, the pressure there can get affected by the rate of heat rejection, okay? That means that you have a, if you have a lower sear uh, outdoor condenser, such as, say, an R22 system that is operating at 275 PSIG on the high side, uh, that either the fins are, are really dirty or they're broken down or it's a, maybe an 8-sear uh, outdoor condensing unit, which is a seasonal energy efficiency rating. That means that the amount of coils is very, very small. A lot of times those 8-sears only have two sides worth of coils. Uh, and... Uh, you know, it could also mean maybe the bushes are right up against the fins. But anyway, if you have 275 PSIG and then you bring that in, then what you're looking at is about 124 degrees for R22 in the middle of the condenser coil. And then it's just going to be however many degrees below that. Uh, maybe it's maybe 115 or something like that on the liquid line. That's a very hot line coming back into the indoor coil. All right, so the head pressure has to do with how much fin is available and the amount of heat rejection that's possible due to, say, how many passes there are on that outdoor unit and what kind of shape those aluminum fins are in. If you have a more efficient, larger system, then the head pressure would be lower. So say you have an R22 system that has maybe 180 PSIG, uh, on the high side, that might be a 14 sear or maybe a 13 sear or something like that on a uh, 75 degree day maybe. Um, but if you have 180 PSIG and you bring that in and you're looking at about 94 degrees for R22, that's the temperature it is in the middle of the outdoor unit. Okay, so this is going to vary depending on the outside temperature and the amount of fins, but really day to day it's changing due to the outdoor temperature. So this low side gauge would be more of a consistent number because 
humans are comfortable anywhere from, say, 68 degrees inside the, the house to maybe, say, 76 degrees. All right. Um, maybe the average would be about 72 degrees. So it doesn't vary as much as, say, the high side does. So this way we can kind of start pegging some numbers down over on the low side gauge. So for R22, what we're looking at is about anywhere from 60 PSIG up to about 85 PSIG. So the same system uh, could operate anywhere along those pressures depending on the day. Now, I will say that typically you're going to find the low side pressure for an R22 system at about, say, at least 64 PSIG. Um, the thing is, sometimes you're working with capillary tube systems, and those tend to be a little bit lower of a pressure on the uh, low side gauge. And that is a metering device that looks just like this. It's a small uh, line instead of a piston inside this orifice chamber. That looks like this. So sometimes the cap tube systems are a little bit lower on the PSIG, all right, but most of the time you're going to be finding anywhere right around 64 or 65 PSIG up to about 80, 81 PSIG, okay? Um, but I'm extending the range a little bit. So we're saying 60 to 85 PSIG, but most of the time it is about 65 PSIG or 64 PSIG to 81 PSIG. Okay, that's most of the time. And that has to do with the temperature outside affecting the temperature on the liquid line as it heads in, and it has to do with the indoor wet bulb temperature. Okay, if it's hot outside and has a high wet bulb uh, inside the house, then the pressure is going to be higher on the high side gauge because this evaporator coil is trying to battle humidity while it's absorbing all of this heat as well. On a cooler day, you don't have much of a wet bulb. You know, the wet bulb temperature is a lot lower, and the liquid line is coming into the evap coil cooler. Uh, you might be at 67 PSIG, okay, right in here on the R22 system. So those numbers that I'm giving you are above 32 degrees, and they are typically not much higher than, say, 50... 0.5 or 51 degrees on the evaporator coil. All right, so that is R22. Now let's go ahead and look at R410A on the low side gauge. Okay, your lowest pressure that you're going to find on a system typically is going to be about 105 right here. If you bring that in, it's about 33 degrees saturated state for R410A. Now, typically you're going to see higher than that. You know, typically you're going to see maybe around 110 or higher, okay? Because that's right around 34, 35 degrees for r 4 a at the evaporator coil. Um, and a lot of times you're going to see right around 40, okay? The closer you are to a 40 degree saturated state is going to be more along the lines of the average. But once again, you're looking at about 105 PSIG up to about 142 PSIG. If you bring the 142 PSIG in, you're looking at about 50, uh, maybe about 50.5 degrees saturated state in the middle of the evaporator coil. So anywhere is in that range, depending on the outdoor temperature and the indoor wet bulb temperature. But most of the time you're going to find with r 4 a systems, it's going to end up being right around 110 to about 136 PSIG or so. Somewhere around in that range is going to be the most of the time it's, it's around in that range right there. I do want to say though, while I'm doing this video on the pressures, okay, I'm giving you a range of pressures that the vapor side is going to normally look like. You definitely want to avoid just trying to charge a system by pressure only, okay? It's not going to be accurate enough. You have to use, uh, say, the superheat charging process if you have a piston. And I'll give you a for instance why. You could have 75% of the days when the system's operating, and it's, and it's okay, all right? Uh, the system is cooling fine. You don't really notice a difference, but the problem is on cooler days, you actually may not have any superheat on the evaporator coil. And there's no way for you to tell if you do or you do not have any superheat on the evaporator coil if you're checking with pressures um, 
just do, you know, without doing the superheat charging process, if you don't have superheat on the evaporator coil, then that means you don't have superheat getting back to the compressor, and that means you have liquid slugging the compressor. All right, it's not going to be all the time, but it's going to be on the days that, like I said, are cooler and the wet bulb temperature is lower in the house. Uh, the temperature is lower in the house. On those days, you're going to be possibly doing damage to the system. So you've got to be able to make sure that you have an accurate superheat across the evaporator coil for the compressors. And that's why you can't charge the system by pressure only and just kind of rules of thumb and things like that. You have to use a superheat and subpoint charging process. That will get you the most accurate the most efficient and the safest for the compressor. Now just so you know I'm going to have the superheat and the subcooling uh, playlists linked in the description below. Uh, you're still going to need to charge or check the charge of the system with the subcooling process which is done on the high side gauge. If you have a thermostatic expansion valve that looks like this at the inlet of the evaporator coil and you have to use the superheat charging process if you have a piston that looks like this or a cap tube system that looks like this. You should be able to find the type of refrigerator on the outdoor unit rating plate on the outdoor compressor and also on the thermostatic expansion valve if there is one. You can also use the pressure temperature correlation when the system is off to determine what refrigerant is in the system. Now onto the high side gauge uh, if you're looking at R22 which is the green um, and then you have R14A, it's the pink, all right? Uh, if we were looking at R22 first for the pressures, this is going to vary much, much wider, all right, of a range. People are going to all be used to different ranges because of the equipment that they're working on. If you have an R22 system, you could have, uh, say, you have one that has fins that are really deteriorated. You might be all the way up at 325 PSIG, which is really, really high, all right? Um, but normally uh, they're going to be lower. A lot of times R22 systems you're going to find below 200 PSIG. You might find them at 180, 160 PSIG, 200 PSIG, uh, but uh, say you're working on a geothermal uh, system that's really really efficient, has a high sear rating, you may be down at maybe even 125 or 145 uh, PSIG. You know, you, you're going to be down a lot lower with the higher sear ratings because they're able to reject the heat a lot easier. If you have a head pressure that is all the way up at 300 or 350, I mean, that, that, that unit's on its last legs. It's having a hard time being able to reject the heat and is not very efficient compared to one with a much lower head pressure. In reference to R410A systems, you might see a head pressure of maybe 230 on a really, really cold day um, with a higher sear air conditioner, maybe a 16 sear or 17 sear. Uh, but most of the time, you're going to find them in the range of maybe about 275. Um, you might find 13 sears somewhere in the range of, say, 300, um, anywhere to say 285 to 325. Like I said, this is going to vary. It really depends on the equipment you're working on, the sear rating you're working on, um, just your environment where, where you're located at. A 14 sear or 16 sear you might find at 240 PSIG on a cooler day, and you might find it at 300 or um, 310 or something like that on a hotter day. But once again, you, you can find them higher, you can find them uh, lower depending on the sear rating. The higher the sear rating, the higher the seasonal energy efficiency rating, the lower the PSIG will be, and the, say, the smaller the unit, and also the smaller the sear, you're going to see the head pressures be a lot higher. All right, but once again, you need to check the refrigerant charge with the superheat and the subcooling processes. Subcooling takes place on the liquid side, and superheat takes place on the vapor side. Check out those videos in reference to how to check the system properly with the superheat and the subcooling charging process. I also link some of the tools I use in the description below. Um, sometimes people ask, you know, what tools I'm using and all that type of stuff as well. Hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.